once a prosperous, thriving home to an advanced civilization. Over thousands of years, the tidal-locked moon of Kenshi devolved into a bleak, post-apocalyptic wasteland where the remnants of second-rate empires battled for scraps while the rest of the continent fell to dangerous wildlife, rebel armies, bandits, slavers, cannibals, and more. To a poor soul born around the fall of Bast, looking up into the night sky, they appeared to live on one of two moons orbiting a planet, but so much knowledge was lost, nothing could be certain. What few scholars remained during this age of primitive ignorance hired mercenaries and tech hunters to sift through rubble and ash, braving the dangers of open land to seek treasures from the past. Not only technology, but also books, scrolls, or even bits of parchment, eager to piece together the history of the continent. From what they learned, the First Empire was the oldest known civilization of Kenshi, ruled by highly advanced ancients, with a territory that expanded across the entire landmass. Thriving thousands of years before the fall of Bast, it is believed the sea levels were far higher in those days, and ship travel common. Little of their civilization is known with certainty, but they may have had a caste system which served as a dividing line between the two known races that populated the empire. Though fully sentient skeleton robots played a large part in their society and culture, with some believing they may have been the dominant masters, there is significant evidence to suggest humans were in fact the ruling power, and it was they who built the robots strong, resilient, and as long as they were properly maintained, could survive indefinitely unless physically destroyed. Other known technologies developed by the First Empire included automated factories, weaponized satellites, genetic engineering, and space elevators. As they were capable of spaceflight, it's possible the humans of the First Empire arrived on Kenshi from another world. At some point, the First Empire went to war with an unknown enemy and built giant behemoth robots with enormous destructive capabilities. Aided by their creations, the Empire was victorious, leaving the behemoths without a purpose. Growing fearful of what they made, the giant robots were ordered into a massive pit where they were buried in metal. Ironically, it was because the behemoths were so loyal and obedient, they marched toward their own destruction without resistance. Even thousands of years later, one could visit the behemoth graveyard and see the price of obedience. As ever, there were many theories for how the First Empire eventually fell, with evidence scarce and open to interpretation. Among the many possible explanations, one of the more likely scenarios saw the Obedience Massacre as a pivotal point where skeletons turned on their creators for destroying their behemoth kin. Seeking justice or perhaps vengeance, the skeleton race may have started a civil war or some kind of rebel movement which sought the extinction of humanity. Perhaps they used a super weapon, instigated an environmental disaster, or employed biological weapons. But many died, with some few only spared because an unlikely hero rose to save the human race. Though he had every reason to hate the creators, it may have in fact been Stove, the last of the behemoth giants, who through unknown means survived the obedience massacre. Thousands of years later, many remembered Stove as a monster who led the skeletons in their bloody campaign of extinction, but evidence actually suggests he fought against the skeletons and sacrificed his life to destroy the weapon or stop the event targeting the last of humanity. Just as obedience survived for thousands of years, so too did the corpse of Stobe, still found in an area called Stobe's Garden. Not only did Stobe forego vengeance and prevent the completion of the first extinction, but he also served as a model and hero for the skeletons who started to regret their actions. Despite their victory, skeletons were sickened by all the death they witnessed and deeply shamed by the sacrifice of Stobe. Many were unable to live with the guilt, resulting in mass suicides, while others learned to endure the pain, forever plagued by bouts of depression. There are even some who believe the skeleton practice of regularly wiping their memories to avoid insanity may have originated from the madness induced by causing and witnessing the first extinction. Though skeletons became the dominant power of the continent, much First Empire technology was lost in the calamitous events of the war, leading to a chaos age where surviving humans descended into primitive barbarism, while the robot population drastically decreased, both from mass suicide and their inability to make more of their kind, unable to keep up production in the factories located in an area that became floodlands. Even after the long years of the Chaos Age, skeletons could not escape the guilt of their past actions, and so a group of heroes banded together to found the Second Empire, led by their greatest warrior, the Emperor Catlon, advised by his friend, the fearsome Tinfist. Their goal was to seek redemption for skeleton kind 
by creating a safe, prosperous society for the remnants of humanity, providing them an environment where they could thrive and advance as a people. Establishing their capital in the southeast, this second empire eventually expanded to become a mighty power with a caste system of their own, placing skeletons as the dominant masters. To protect the human population, Catlon and his government established a police force and army, which included the legendary hydraulic knights under General Jang. Though sea levels fell over time, the Second Empire possessed seafaring technology and often sent hydraulic knights to combat piracy, but their fiercest challenge came from battles with northern cannibal tribes. As the extent of the war was unknown, its possible skeletons acted only defensively, or else perhaps the enemy cannibals simply proved too numerous to entirely eradicate. In any case, the tribes ultimately survived and continued to prosper in the northwest of the continent. Yet even so, the skeletons did so much damage that over a thousand years later, cannibals still told tales about the terror of hydraulic knights. Among the technological advancements possessed by the Second Empire, they were adept with genetic engineering and so enhanced some humans with the traits and minds of warriors so they might serve in a cast of enforcers, possibly acting as a branch of the Imperial military. Though Catlon's nation prospered for many years, the growing human population started to present larger problems for the government. One of the greatest threats to civil order came from a steadily growing human cult that worshipped So, the last behemoth who sacrificed his life for humanity. As the cult's origins are unknown, it may have started in the Second Empire or earlier in the Age of Chaos, but over time it spread among humans. Yet while this cult revered a giant robot, they also hated the skeleton robots who nearly wiped out their people. Eventually, the name Stobe was lost to history, replaced with Kitrin, and so the cult started interpreting their own history as follows. Long ago, humans lost faith in their great and powerful god Kitrin. Yet when a great calamity arose, they repented and begged Kitrin's help. A merciful deity, he forgave his children and sacrificed his life to cleanse the planet of sickness. Kitrin was then reborn in two forms, Ocarin, the god of day, warmth and renewal, and Narco, god of night, cold and destruction. In reality, Kitrin was likely Stobe, the good robot who saved humanity, while the hero god Ocarin was associated with human males, and Narco represented females, skeletons, and eventually all non-humans. Possibly learning from the example of Stobe, much of the cult's early teachings revolved around peace, personal responsibility, and kindness to others. But over time, with so much of their true history lost during the Age of Chaos, the Second Empire cultists forgot that Kitrin, or Stobe, was also a robot, and so associated Ocarin with humanity, encouraging their more extreme elements to hate technology and discriminate against anyone who wasn't human, considering them potential agents of narco, including all skeleton kind. Organizing themselves into more of a proper religion, the cultists started to follow a leader known as the Holy Phoenix, who acted as lawgiver and messenger of Ocarin. Upon his deathbed, the Phoenix declared his spirit would return in the first male child born after his death. It was in this way the second Phoenix was chosen, and this tradition continued for over a thousand years. Although the exact origins of the rebellion are unknown, at some point, the cultists started creating disturbances and clashing with the government. Seeking to restore order, Catlon chose to be punitive and crush these state enemies, sending General Hat-12, leader of the police force, to deal with the problem. Yet his iron-fisted approach only inflamed tensions and further increased the popularity of more extreme factions within the cult, who spread the message skeletons were agents of narco, hoping to destroy humanity in a second extinction. Though this division caused great harm, Emperor Catlon refused to compromise and escalated to using military forces like the Hydraulic Knights against his own citizens in an attempt to eradicate the rebellion. It's possible the Enforcers were also sent against the cultists, which may explain why they grew to hate any who were not pure-blood humans, which in their eyes only meant lighter-skinned Greenlanders and dark-skinned Scorchlanders. The Enforcers were considered violent beasts who served narco, which meant mixing with their kind was akin to bestiality. The rebellion went on for centuries, slowly weakening the empire and pushing Catlon to new extremes, becoming an oppressive tyrant who increased focus on the military while ignoring the administrative duties required to sustain a prosperous civilization. Nevertheless, the decline of the empire was slow, and roughly 937 years before the fall of Bast, the Second Empire still had a large territory, including the thriving market town Catch, where the famous Armor King set up shop, remaining at this location for the next thousand years. 
At some point, the cultist rebellion grew so large and powerful, they broke apart from the Second Empire, establishing the Holy Nation in the fertile lands at the center of the continent. Far from his dream of redeeming skeleton kind, Catlon only grew more aggressive and tyrannical to the point he started killing innocent citizens while locking human children in cages. Yet while Catlon charged forward with his anti-human agenda, the rest of skeleton kind saw his madness and understood how far they strayed from the original plan. Many started to leave the Second Empire, including the Emperor's longtime friend, Tinfist, who still desired to help humanity, and so went on to become a liberator of slaves and popular folk hero. Meanwhile, Catlon's empire continued to decline. Unwilling to allow any further betrayal, Catlon committed his most shocking act yet by removing the sentience of many remaining skeleton followers, turning them into mindless robot slaves. The final catastrophe for the Empire came when a great famine struck and Catlon was unable to find a solution. Desperate to survive, the state dissolved as individual peoples migrated to more resource-rich lands or else simply ended their association with the Second Empire. As all this occurred, Catlon remained sat on his throne in the capital, surrounded by mindless thralls, unable to stop the fall of his empire. Yet even so, he refused to see the error of his ways, stewing in anger and bitterness for the next thousand years. Those few skeletons who were not thralled, yet remained loyal to Catlon, formed the Skeleton Legion, continuing to patrol the Ashlands in the name of their Mad Emperor. Yet the legacy of his reign could be found across the continent, with even their common currency, cats, named after the Emperor. With the ruined remnant of the Second Empire bottled in the southeast, the continent once again entered into an age of conflict, as individuals and peoples joined existing or emerging factions which competed for resources. Scattering in every direction, some humans became nomads or formed gangs, while others founded independent realms and settlements like Deadcat in the north, Mongrel in the Foglands, and the tech hunter cities Black Scratch, Flats Lagoon, and World's End. For those who sought larger states, there was the Holy Nation, including the regions of Ocran's Gulf, Ocran's Pride, the Arm of Ocran, Ocran's Valley, and Rebirth, as well as the cities of Bad Teeth, Stack, and their capital Blister Hill. Their government, ruled by the Holy Phoenix, not only discriminated against non-humans, but viewed women as property and demanded religious obedience from all their citizens. However, they also had strong walls and a fearsome army that offered decent protection in addition to holding some of the most fertile lands on the continent. Over the years, environmental conditions worsened across the landmass, turning many territories into wasteland. But the fertile soil of the Holy Nation remained prosperous, becoming increasingly rare and valuable. This meant that the benefits of joining the Holy Nation included walled cities, the protection of armies, and plenty of food. Aside from the Holy Nation, those humans or anyone who sought a non-religious state that did not discriminate based on race or gender could join the United Cities Empire, formed as a successor state to the Second Empire through an alliance of cities in the South and Northeast, including Drifter's Last, Clownsteady, Catan, Morn, Brink, Hang, Bast, and the great desert cities of Shobatai, Stoat, Bark, and Heft. In addition to offering walled cities and samurai armies for protection, the United Cities had no interest in the religion or day-to-day -day lives of their citizens so long as they followed the law. Yet this state also had problems, as it lacked many fertile lands and was run by an overprivileged emperor and alliance of nobles in league with the Traders Guild who sought to increase their wealth and power at the expense of the population. While the Holy Nation and United Cities were large nations that could provide some measure of protection for their people, both were also massive slave states that fueled their survival and growth off the backs of those they captured and forced into labor. They grew so dependent on slavery, they not only captured foreigners, but also domestic enemies for their workforce. In the Holy Nation, the region of Rebirth became a massive slave camp where many were sent to toil until death, while the United City's nobles grew so corrupt and wealthy from slavery, they eventually made it illegal to be poor within the Empire, giving them an excuse to arrest even more of their own citizens. As a result of all this brutality, rebel factions emerged, like the Holy Nation Outlaws of the Hub, the Flotsam Ninjas of the Hidden Forest, the Rebel Farmers of the North, and the Anti-Slavers of Spring, ruled by Tinfist and his Fist of Justice. A slave rebellion even claimed the mining town of Morn, which became independent under the influence of tech hunters. In addition to battling rebels, these great states also went to war with each other, eventually resulting in the Holy Nation's invasion and destruction of Bast, turning the area into a highly contested war zone with the United Cities. While humans spread far and wide, most enforcers remained together, migrating to the Sten Desert, Border Zone, and Spider Plains. 
Thebans, including the cities of Squin, Last Stand, the Great Fortress, and the capital Admag. Over time, enforcers veered further away from their human kin, not only in culture, but also at some point in appearance, growing bone plates and spikes all over their bodies. Embracing these changes, they let horns grow long as a sign of their prowess, while those defeated in battle had their horns cut off, leaving them second-rate citizens of their society. Becoming known as the Shek, the legendary hero Kral first united the tribes to form the Shek Kingdom, providing the basis for their warrior culture, strict honor code, and philosophy. After Kral's death, they continued to be ruled by their greatest warrior and discriminated against other races until individuals proved themselves in combat. Hated enemies of the Holy Nation, the Shek were often at war with their human neighbors, but also fought among themselves, breaking into factions over disputes of leadership and other conflicts. After parting ways with Catlon's empire, some skeletons went mad, were reprogrammed, went to banditry and cults, or else settled in various areas across the continent, including their own settlements like Black Desert City in the Deadlands, where they were protected from outsiders by harsh environmental conditions, like constant acid rain which hurt non-skeletons. As many of their kind retained memories from long ago, some robots became scholars, like Io, the second-in-command at the Great Research Lab in World's End, who made it his mission to hide certain parts of their history, presumably in an effort to avoid further discrimination and hostility between the peoples of the continent. Although Kenshi was littered with smaller factions and bandits, a unique stalemate existed in the swamps, where swampers ran the outlaw city of Shark. Considered neutral territory, the five major gangs of the region all had a presence, though the Hounds held the greatest influence after establishing their headquarters in the city. The Black Shifters were the next most powerful as they ran the local casino, followed by the Grey Flayers, Twin Blades, and Stone Rats, which came and went as they pleased. Outside of these larger organizations, Swamp Ninjas and Red Sabers roamed the region as well. All their larger gangs included the Shrieking Bandits of the Northwest, the Dust Bandits, Trade Ninjas, and Black Dragon Ninjas of the Border Zone, the Shinobi Thieves who occupy towers in many settlements, the Crab Raiders of the East Coast, and the Reavers, a faction of slavers who wished to overthrow the United City's government. Long outlasting the Second Empire, the cannibal tribes continued to prosper in the North, while beyond their lands, courageous hunters fought massive leviathan beasts by the coast. As the races of the fallen Second Empire spread throughout the continent, they encountered hivers, insect-like humanoids who functioned as an extension of the larger hive run by a single all-powerful queen. Living in vain, Dreg, the Fog Islands, Royal Valley, and Grey Shelf, the origins of their people remained a complete mystery, even to scholars, with possibilities that included genetic engineering by rogue elements of the Second Empire, as most skeletons do not recognize them from those ancient days. Or else perhaps they were native to Kenshi, growing larger and more sentient over time. It might be that they migrated from another land, or even came from another world. Individual hivers were fiercely loyal to their hive, but if they remained out of contact for too long, could lose that connection and become hiveless, forever exiled from their home. These hiveless grew more independent, capable of living rich, active lives. Yet even so, they often suffered from depression, as they felt purposeless without a hive. Similar to Hivers, the Fishmen of Cheaters Run and Fishman Island were a relatively intelligent species which followed a king and might also be native to Kenshi, genetically engineered or anything else, with almost no available information about their origins. Many centuries after the fall of the Second Empire, the United Cities continued as a powerful state yet suffered a catastrophe when famine struck the southern half of the empire. Although the Traders Guild sent food shipments, bandits and raiders blockaded the roads, meaning only a fraction of the help sent actually arrived. Eager to survive this hardship, the nobility of the South fought to hoard the goods brought in, leaving the rest of the population to starve. As a result, the Red Rebellion erupted, and the streets ran red with the blood of UC citizens. Although the nobility ultimately won the civil war, the Emperor Anzai was killed, leading to the selection of Emperor Tengu as their new leader, a cruel, spoiled, callous dullard who was chosen to act as a puppet for the aristocracy, ruling from the capital of Heft. In addition to battling the farmer rebels, anti-slavers, reavers, and cannibals who constantly waged war on the United Cities, they also faced the wrath of their own citizens pushed too far, like in the Rebellion, or else the tale of Luquin, a boy sold into slavery where he was beaten, starved, and watched his family killed or worked to death. After his mother sacrificed her life so he could escape at the age of 15, he was found by a ninja clan and trained as a stealthy assassin. 
Seven years later, he returned to the Empire and went on a campaign of vengeance to kill a number of nobles until he was finally caught, arrested, and imprisoned in Tengu's vault. In addition to physical punishments, Lu Kun was forced to write a book in tribute to the Emperor. West of Heft, the Holy Nation continued to prosper, though they were often at war with the Shek Kingdom. The Holy Nation outlaw rebels, the women and ex-slaves turned flotsam ninjas, the cannibals of the north, and at times the United Cities, with the most recent war erupting in Bast, ending a long stretch of peace between these states. At the time of the invasion of Bast, the Holy Nation followed the 62nd Holy Phoenix, raised all his life for the job. He was so devout that at the age of 16, he sentenced his own family to be purged in holy fire. Over in the Sten Desert, King Shagger of the Shek Kingdom continued the legacy of his predecessors by relentlessly attacking their holy nation enemies, in addition to waging war against the United Cities and any other enemy that presented itself. Yet this strategy was failing and their people falling to ruin, losing the Great Fortress, the Old Front Lines, and other settlements in the fighting. Nevertheless, he refused to change tactics, and in the end, ordered a final suicidal death charge into enemy ranks so they might die as true warriors. But not all were willing to throw away their lives so easily, causing the warrior Bayan to publicly object. To everyone's surprise, Bayan was then backed up by Asada the Stone Golem, a member of the Invincible Five, considered one of the best fighters in the kingdom. Understanding there was only one response to this challenge, Shagger and Asada fought an epic duel, ending in the king's death. Now ruling their people, with Bayan as her advisor, Esada pulled back their armies, made peace with the United Cities, and opened their borders to trade. Though she still valued their warrior code, she was determined to reform their society and ensure their long-term survival. Yet even so, the Shek still had many enemies, including the Bugmaster, a mysterious man controlling spider insects to the south, as well as the Holy Nation, and a series of rebel groups, like the Berserkers, who wish a return to the old ways, Kral's Chosen, who follow Flying Bull, a loyal friend of the fallen King Shagger, and the Band of Bones, a bandit crew who follow the disgraced warrior Tora the Fearless. The final major power of the continent were Hivers, who split into the peaceful, trade-loving Western Hive, and the hostile, meat-eating Southern Hive, as well as the Fogmen, who appear as mad, roving Hivers without a queen. Declining for thousands of years from the age of the First Empire, the continent descended into an unforgiving wasteland, where life was nasty, brutish and short, where every day was a struggle to survive, and slavery was sometimes preferable to freedom. Yet for those with ambition, cunning, and a means to earn cats, it was possible to live a decent life, and in some cases, thrive, making meaningful changes and a lasting impact on the continent. In truth, with enough experience and luck, anything is possible on the moon of Kenshi. A special thanks to all those who contribute to Civilization X, like Daren of House Ashford, Sir Jeremiah Ironside of House Kamsia, Sir Elendil of Numenor, and Fred Heartless, Knight of Iron and Ice. If you'd like to help the channel, be sure to give a like, leave a comment, subscribe, and click on the links below, or else go to patreon.com slash civilizationx, where you can gain early access to videos, vote on future content, and watch the Patreon-only series, Heroes of Lore and Legend.